In the summer of 1991, the anticipation was mounting. Nintendo was primed to launch the successor to the wildly popular Nintendo Entertainment System, the Super Nintendo, and bundled with it, Super Mario World. With charming characters, unforgettable level design, perfect platforming controls, and a soundtrack that exudes pure joy, Super Mario World is a platforming masterpiece. But in the summer of 1991, nothing was guaranteed. Developers at Nintendo had been tasked with creating a game that would not only propel the Mario franchise forward, but also show the world the power of the Super Nintendo. Everything was riding on it. In this review and retrospective, I'll explore the history of Super Mario World's development and examine every delightful aspect of the game, reminding you of moments you've forgotten and unearthing secrets you've never known. In 1985, Nintendo released Super Mario Bros. on the Famicom and Nintendo Entertainment System. Designed by then 33-year-old Shigeru Miyamoto and 25-year-old Takashi Tezuka, Super Mario Bros. ushered in a new era for video games, making platforming, power-ups, hidden secrets, and bite-sized levels gaming standards. With over 40 million copies in circulation, it almost single-handedly revitalized the wavering video game market and made Mario a household name. After the success of the original title, kids were clamoring for a sequel. In Japan, Nintendo released Super Mario Bros. 2, but it was brutally difficult and looked much like the first game. Nintendo of America decided not to localize it and requested instead that Famicom title Yume Kojo Doki Doki Panic be retooled with the characters, items, sounds, and abilities from Super Mario Bros. On October 9, 1988, the American version of Super Mario Bros. 2 was released. Due to its unique origins, it looked and felt very different than the first game but kids didn't care. It was colorful, full of secrets, had clever gameplay, new enemies, and with the choice of four unique playable characters, kids' appetite for Mario was temporarily satisfied. Mario! 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 But as time went by, fans were eager for more. With powerful marketing and pre-release gameplay introduced in the feature film The Wizard, hype for Mario 3 reached rock star levels. On February 12, 1990, Super Mario Bros. 3 was unleashed. With an expansive overworld map, thematic worlds, a whole slew of new power-ups, and dynamic new moves like sliding down slopes and the ability to fly, it didn't disappoint. The fever pitch excitement for anything related to Mario cannot be overstated. Super Mario Bros. 1, 2, and 3 all rank in the top four best-selling NES games of all time, and the only non-Mario game couldn't have done it without him. Mario had invaded games, television, movies, and merchandise, and more importantly, he had invaded our imaginations. So when rumors began to swirl about a new 16-bit Nintendo console featuring an all-new Super Mario game, the anticipation was palpable. Super Mario World was developed by Nintendo's famous Entertainment Analysis and Development Division. Produced by Shigeru Miyamoto and directed by Takashi Tezuka, the team behind the original Super Mario Bros., with Koji Kondo handling the music. It was the dream team. But still, the task of creating the flagship game for new hardware was daunting. Before starting Super Mario World, we ported Mario 3 to the Super Famicom as a hardware experiment. And even though the colors and sprites were more detailed, it was the same game again. We had to create something new. As these images reveal, even early builds borrowed a lot from Mario 3. So to set it apart and advance the franchise, the team focused on incorporating fresh concepts, power-ups, and playstyles. The idea for Yoshi was an early one for Miyamoto. He kept this sketch at his desk since the days of the original Super Mario Bros. And Yoshi's appearance is strikingly similar to the protagonist in Miyamoto's Devil World. 
Artist Shigafumi Hino originally drew him much more realistically lizard-like, but after input and multiple revisions arrived at the cute, happy-go-lucky companion we know today. With orange arms. That's right, he has orange arms. And Link has pink hair. To further set Super Mario World apart from its predecessors, the team unapologetically worked in all the stunning new effects made possible with the Super Nintendo hardware. Mode 7 rotation and scaling, enormous on-screen enemies, large numbers of up to 128 simultaneously moving objects, transparency, mosaic pixelation, multiple scrolling backgrounds, background and foreground layering, and the use of 256 unique simultaneous colors from a palette of over 32,000 choices. They were poised to impress. While most of the team focused on the look and feel of the game, composer Koji Kondo had challenges of his own. With the Super Famicom, you have to create the sound samples themselves, so compared with the Famicom, it was a hundred times more difficult. For Super Mario World, I decided I would try and use sounds that resembled the normal instruments you hear in the real world. So after three years of creative collaboration and long nights in the office, the team's efforts were about to be revealed to the world. And for Mario fans, life was about to get 16 bits better. Introducing the next generation from Nintendo, New Super Mario World, created especially for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. It's a bit more exciting, a bit more challenging, a bit more graphic, a bit more colorful, a bit more realistic, a bit more levels, a bit more secret, a bit more enemies, a bit more friends, a bit more sound, a bit hotter, a bit cooler, a bit weird, a bit more revolutionary, a bit more Mario, a bit more of what you want. It's 16 bit and it's yours only if you get new Super Nintendo. Now you're playing with power, superpower. In August 1991, the much-awaited Super Nintendo Entertainment System launched in stores. And as the launch title and pack-in game, Super Mario World had to be more than just a great game. It had to be a statement. This new system was, in fact, Super. <laughs> The moment kids saw the cartridge, they knew Super Mario World would be special. There against a bright blue background, they were greeted by a joyful Mario wearing a cape and riding a dinosaur. Simple as it was, that image promised heroism and adventure. Only the Mushroom, Fire Flower, and Star Man, the three original power-ups from Mario 1, returned for Super Mario World. But these new power-ups were refreshing, innovative, and thankfully they would be the heart of the game. By grabbing a feather, our humble plumber transforms into Cape Mario. Much like the raccoon leaf, both power-ups allow Mario to whip enemies, glide down from a fall, and fly. But unlike Raccoon Mario, Cape Mario could remain airborne with well-timed back presses on the D-pad. And by pressing forward, he could dive bomb the ground. Sure, the magic cape allows you to bypass certain levels, but whether you play them on the ground or in the air, you'll have fun doing it. The most notable addition is Mario's bouncy new dinosaur friend with the bottomless stomach, Yoshi. Or as Nintendo's official character manual calls him, T. Yoshisaur Munchakupas. Weird. As a power-up companion, Yoshi is extremely useful. When Mario punches him in the head, his frog-like tongue lashes out, grabbing anything in reach. He can also stomp enemies into oblivion, walk freely on dangerous objects, and he provides you with a second mid-air jump, essentially a double jump, but with the cost that you must dismount mid-air, often sacrificing him in the process. When he tries to eat a Koopa shell, which is understandably hard to swallow, he'll hold it in his mouth and get a special ability depending on the color of the shell. Yellow ones allow him to ground pound nearby enemies, blue ones allow him to fly, and with red ones he can spit a spread shot volley of fireballs. When you get to the Star Road levels, you'll find the rare yellow, blue, and red Yoshi. These will manifest these same colored shell abilities, but are based on Yoshi's color, no matter what shell he has in his mouth. With the Super Nintendo's additional buttons came a new ability, the Spin Jump. With it, Mario can break rotating blocks, access secrets, leap off Yoshi, and kill most enemies in a single hit. Players were also given a power-up reserve box at the top of the screen. When Mario would become small, or by pressing select, this reserve item would drop down. As the development team often did, this potential advantage also came with a potential cost. If Mario failed to grab the falling item, it would be gone for good. There are other odd additions, like the power balloon that makes Mario puff up and drift through the sky. Moons were three extra men. 
green star bonus blocks that reward you with a 1-up if you find at least 30 coins in a level, power-up roulette blocks, and a cloud that hatches from a Yoshi egg and throws happy coins. The power-up system of Super Mario World took gameplay in a completely different direction than Super Mario Bros. 3. What it lost in quantity, it gained in complexity. The addition of the spin jump, the cape, and more revolutionarily, Yoshi, gave players new depths of control and gave Mario everything he needed to explore this Super Mario World. Dinosaur Land is an odd place, constructed with unique geometric shapes and populated with a quirky cast of characters. In the NES days, most characters paced mindlessly, but for the Super Nintendo, developers took them to the next level, giving them personalities and bringing the world to life in the most charming ways. Koopas have been in the series from the beginning, but this time around they felt much more alive, walking on two legs, crawling outside their shells, and often soaring through the skies as Super Koopas. Big Boos may haunt ghost houses, but really, they're afraid of you. When you're not looking, they float spookily towards you with menacing fangs, but as soon as you face them, these big boos cower, as if hiding their eyes makes them invisible to you. Blargs are dragon-like creatures that lurk mainly in the molten lava flows of Vanilla Dome. Their eyes peek above the surface, scanning for danger and potential prey, and at the right time, they dip down and strike, just as Mario's skull raft approaches. Wigglers exude personality trotting peacefully among the trees with four pairs of shoes and a flower sprouting from their head. They seem like friendly caterpillars, but after you jump on them, they burn red with anger and aggressively pursue you. The most bizarre character is the football-kicking, baseball-throwing, charging Chuck. With the shell on his back, I suppose he's some sort of Hammer Brother variation, but with an aptitude for sports. Whatever he is, he's an odd addition to the world. But considering it's called Dinosaur Land, there aren't many dinosaurs, and while the lands are imaginatively named after desserts, their names have little to do with their designs. I guess Donut Plains is kinda circular with a hole in the center, and Chocolate Island is decidedly brown, but there's nothing especially vanilla about Vanilla Dome, and Cheese Bridge is neither cheesy nor is there much bridge. Sure, there are some themes, such as Forest of Illusion being set in a forest, but overall level variety isn't based on environment like previous games, but rather on various level types within worlds, like platforming levels, swimming levels, obstacle levels, ghost houses, fortresses, and castles. These archetypes have unique gameplay mechanics, and since they're scattered throughout the game, they keep players guessing. Ghost houses, for example, not only feel different than traditional levels with spooky music, wooden beams, and booze ethereally fading in and out, but actually play different too, with tricky puzzles and cleverly hidden exits. When you find a level's exit, a new path will be revealed, often dynamically morphing the geography around it. But 24 levels in the game have either a second exit gate or a secret keyhole that opens up another path. Most ghost houses have a second exit, as do all levels represented by a red dot on the map. Finding these hidden exits feels like the natural evolution of Mario-style secrets introduced in the original game. But these require more exploration, and since Mario often needs specific items to access them, they require more skill as well. Developers also added lots of optional content, with special levels that were much more challenging, as well as many regular levels and secrets that could be bypassed completely. In fact, it's possible to defeat Bowser by finding only 11 of the game's 96 exits, but there's great fun in finding everything Super Mario World has to offer. The Star World levels, for example, are very rewarding. You feel like you're in a forbidden area, you find new colorful Yoshis, and the stars are teleportation shortcuts across Dinosaur Land. But after finding the keyhole in Star World 5, you gain access to an even more forbidden area, the Special World. I've never been crazy about the extreme 90s level names here like Mondo and Gnarly and Tubular. In Japan they have better names like Specialist's Course, Championship Course, and best of all, even the Mario Staff is Shocked Course. Yeah, that's real. These levels are some of the most difficult in the game, and developers knew it too, giving you an in-game congratulations as you completed them, and permanently changing the overworld and Koopa sprites as proof of your accomplishment. Weird. Just as in the original Super Mario Brothers, each area ends with a castle. 
Beyond the usual fireballs and pools of lava, these castles take on a more medieval tone with chained flails, sharpened spike columns, and enormous wooden smashers. Often you must ride a platform that snakes unpredictably between dangerous obstacles and over spikes and lava. The challenge isn't just avoiding the hazards, but doing so on an ever-changing platform with such little space to maneuver. Then, at the end of each castle, behind an imposing red boss door, you face one of Bowser's seven children, the Koopalings. Iggy and Larry throw things at you as a slab of earth bobs in the lava. Morton and Roy walk along the walls and ceiling of a room, attempting to smash you from above. Lemmy and Wendy hide in pipes as fireballs bounce around the room, and Ludwig spits fire and spins along the floor in his spiny shell. These encounters aren't especially difficult, but the variety keeps it fun and watching the playful ways Mario destroys each castle is a perfect example of the delight sprinkled throughout Dinosaur Land. Koji Kondo's Super Mario World score highlights the vibrant art style with whimsical instrumentation, drawing players in by creating moods that fit their environments. And with the Super Nintendo's eight channels of high-quality sound and 256 points of left-right separation, he also highlights exactly what this new system could do. To truly appreciate these enhancements, I suggest you put on a pair of headphones for this next part. I'll wait. The Forest of Illusion theme captures the playful yet mysterious sense of exploring the woods. The underground level music echoes along methodically, creating the perfect atmosphere for caves. And as a special touch, no matter what theme is playing, drums come in whenever you're riding Yoshi. But Kondo demonstrates his genius even further by using one primary melody throughout the game. With mere alterations in tone, pitch, tempo, and accompaniment, this primary melody is retained and each level archetype is brought to life. I often think back to that summer in 1991, when anticipation filled the air for Nintendo's new system. Super Mario World was coming and we were so eager to play it. But even now, as the graphics and system effects have aged, the game itself continues to shine. With a perfect mixture of playfulness and nostalgia, epic grandeur and seemingly insignificant details, there's an undeniable magic to its design. Nintendo's dream team had created a masterpiece. They stepped out of the shadow of Super Mario Bros. 3 by returning to the roots of the original game, with simple power-ups, foreboding lava-filled castles, and early ideas that had gone unused. And they stepped into the horizon, fulfilling the promise of the Super Nintendo, pushing the franchise forward in epic new directions, directions that echo in the series to this day. They gave the world its favorite little dinosaur and most importantly of all, brought joy to generations. Takashi Tezuka once said, This was my approach to Mario. I want to make games that no matter how many times you clear them, you want to keep that game and hold on to it like a treasure. And with Super Mario World, he did. Mm -hmm. 